Hello, this is the last unit for this class, which I hope you are enjoying. All right, so we'll see how I, if I have to write, I apologize because you know I busted up my hand. I see the guy, the doctor tomorrow. So we'll see how this goes. All right, classification. So we talk about classification. We've kind of talked a little bit about some of these topics already. So some of it's gonna be kind of a review. So in the beginning, in the beginning, um, there were two kingdoms, plant or animal. So that's kind of like the traditional classification system. Um, and so if it stays in place and photosynthesizes, it's a plant. If it walks and eats, it's an animal. So it's kind of like, well, what do we do with this little guy here? Because he moves, but he doesn't eat. He photosynthesizes. Or what, where would you put a mushroom, for that matter, which you guys are familiar with? Okay. So then they came up with what's called the five kingdom system. And so we have, and generally we use Latin names. So like this would be kingdom plantae, animalia, fungi. And then we had um, here, these were the monerans or kingdom monera. Um, and so we had five kingdoms and this we generally refer to as the junk drawer. So if it didn't fit in any one of these kingdoms, we threw it in Kingdom Protista. And then because of Carl Woese, he discovered, if you recall, he discovered that Monera should be split into two kingdoms because they are that much different. We have eubacteria and archaebacteria. So again, this should be all review. Okay. And then we decided, you know, Protista is still, uh, it was still a hot mess. So... We now have this domain concept. So you can see here where we have bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. So basically these two are your prokaryotes versus this group, which is the eukaryotes, right? Cells with membrane bound organelles. They have a nucleus, they have a mitochondria. Some have a chloroplast, okay? So, and you can kind of see where all those kingdoms, protistas, plantae, fungi, and amelia, they're all eukaryotic organisms, all right? And then we have these two schools of classification. So we have taxonomy and taxonomy organizes life according to similar traits. They look the same. And then we have phylogenetics that they don't just look at traits, they look at evolutionary relationships. It's a little different. So when we talk about taxonomy, again, the job of taxonomists is to arrange and classify organisms. Um, we talked about the binomial naming system, and that's where we use two names. And uh, we talked about uh, Linnaeus and how he came up with this particular naming system to make sure scientists were talking about the same organism. All right, so we have the first name is the genus, the second is the species. So Homo habilis, that's one of the species in our family tree, which we'll get to later in this unit. And so we have this classification where we go from small, like this would be one individual, this would contain a few and then more and then more. So um, we go from kingdom, domain is the broadest, right? And we go kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So as a biology major, one of the first things they taught us was um, the an acronym King Philip came over for good sport. Some people say good sex. Some people say good soup. Don't know why we want soup. All right, so there's a bunch of different ways that we would use to remember the order of this classification system. And like I said, domain is a fairly new um, category because this was just this was just too precise, and there just was too there were too many organisms that didn't fit properly. So domain is much more broad. Okay, and so here's an example using the kingdom system. So all of these organisms here are kingdom animalia. Next, we go to Chordata. We get rid of the starfish there in phylum, uh, what we call phylum, um, Echinodermata. They don't have um, a backbone. Okay, so that would be chordates. Um, so all those organisms have like vertebrae and, and a backbone, like a, a 
a spinal cord basically. And then we get rid of the snakes because they're in uh, phylum reptilia. Um, these are all mammals. Right. And then we go to carnivora, which gets rid of the squirrels. And then we end up going to family Ursidae, which contain bears. Oh, let's drop that, which gets rid of those. Now this guy here, the panda, oh my gosh, you could do a lot of research on the panda. We're still arguing where to put pandas. And there is support for both putting it with the raccoon family, which is kind of crazy, um, or the bears. And then there's the red panda. So we're still trying to work this out because certain, um, I don't want to say taxonomy, but, you know, when looking at molecular and anatomy and physiology and all this other stuff, it, they just don't fit. And so one of the papers is, uh, is a panda just a panda? And we used to debate this um, in my AP bio class. It was kind of cool to see what students would come up with. And then we have um, Ursus, which gets rid of that panda. And then we can go to, which my whole thing's in the way. Uh, we can go to Ursus maritimus, which is just a polar bear. Okay. So that's just one specific species. So phylogenetic tree, when we're talking about trees, we're going to use what's called cladistics, and it's a field of classifying and naming based on that evolutionary relationship. So a phylogenetic tree is a diagram, and it shows that evolutionary relationships. And so when we look at this, we can see using uh, molecular using using molecular um, data, approximately um, the differences, the, the mutations in the genes and the differences and approximately how far back in time they split from a common ancestor. So when we look at this, we can say here, you know, A and B are more closely related than C, D, E. Here, you know, C, D is more closely related E. Now, all of them originated from that common ancestor way back in time, all right? So this is kind of how we, we use these trees to show evolutionary relationships. And so we can look here um, with methods to classify life. And again, this is kind of review. Remember, we talked about fossils. We look about the fossil record. We know the fossil record's not complete. Not all specimens um, are preserved as fossils. Some of the specimens we haven't found yet. We talked about homology versus analogy. This is kind of, this is a great unit because we're kind of reviewing many of the concepts we already took for your final. Right, so we know that homology, those homologous and homologous structures, we talk about structure, versus function. So again, homologous, structure, homologous structures have the same structure. I'm going to abbreviate here because it hurts to write, uh, but different function. Okay, analogy is the opposite. They have different structures. I'm just going to put opposite here. They have different structures, but the same function. Okay, so we can see all the bones. <laughs> this is my problem right here. These bones right there. Um, either I broke them or I tore stuff. All right. Um, but you can see how they're all similar in their structure, but they do different things. You know, swimming, uh, running, grabbing, you know, turtle walking. Um, versus here, these two have the same function. They are both used for flight. But if you look at the bone structure, they're definitely different. We also have what's called convergent versus divergent evolution. And so when we talk about this, when you look at both of these organisms, you know, if you were a classical taxonomist, they look the same. When you just look at the characteristic, they're both streamlined. They have this dorsal fin and their flippers. Um, so they have a lot of things that are the same because they're in the same environment. So they are totally different. This is a marine reptile and this is a mammal. And so when we look at this, you know, they, they 
have a very, very, very distant um, relative, right? We could say all life on our planet is um, distantly related to like a single cell bacteria, right? So we're kind of hopefully I'm driving to, to, to teach her. Um, these are very, very, very distantly related. Okay. But their traits are convergent. They came together. So they're two different lines that solve the problem. They're both predators in the water and they solve the problem in very similar ways, but they're not closely related at all. Okay. That's convergent. Um, I like to show plant ones too, because if you look at these plants, you think, oh, they're very similar. Mm -mm. One's a cactus and one's a euphorb. The euphorb is found in Africa and Madagascar. So both these plants, they are very, very, very distantly related. They solve the problem of being eaten in the same way they have modified leaves. And those modified leaves are thorns. So that to discourage herbivores from eating them. Okay, so this is another one where they solve the problem the same way. So systematics, methods um, that systematics use to classify life. Again, we're looking at um, divergent. Divergent is where they came from a common ancestor, but they've been, they've changed over time. They've, they have diversified. Okay, and those are those homologous structures here that we've been looking at over and over again. We also have something called parallel evolution, and that's organisms that are not closely related but have similar traits. And we've kind of talked about the difference between placental uh, mammals and our marsupials. And you can see how um, each of these have very similar counterparts because they develop traits that helped them in a very similar environment, right? So most of these would be like um, other continents other than Australia. Australia, marsupials did very well. Um, those organisms survived uh, versus the rest of the world where placental mammals uh, out competed the marsupials. And so methods that systematics use to classify, they're going to use, like, again, they're going to use, we talk about anatomy, fossils, anatomy, and now number three, molecular, okay? And again, this should all be review, all right? So with today's technology, we can just look at the DNA, we can look at the amino acids, the proteins, um, but there's some debate on how to use this, this tool. Do we look at just one, uh, you know, a couple genes, one gene, the whole genome, like all the genes of an organism? Do we look at the nucleotides, like the GADC, the DNA, or do we look at the proteins and the amino acids? Um, and then we also have this tool called the molecular clock. And a molecular clock, we have observed there is a, basically there are mutations at specific rates. And based on that information, we can we can um, extrapolate how long ago those organisms have diverged. And so here is a molecular clock. So if we look at this, this was the common ancestor in 10 million years. Notice we have a mutation right here and here. Another 10 million years now we have, so we have one mutation. Another 10 million, we have two. If we kept going another 10 million, we have three mutations and keep going and keep going. And we can use this tool to get a lot of information. Um, so here, using that average change in DNA, we can kind of link. And we can see like approximately how long these individuals have diverged. Notice this is a million years ago. So 4,000 million, basically almost 4 billion years ago. E. coli, and then we branched off to yeast, and then we went to basically worms. And we can keep saying, seeing this, this change in this particular um, DNA. Okay, and what we're looking at is the DNA in the small subunit of RNA, okay, um, 
So we can look at that. We can also look at neutral, the parts of the DNA that doesn't code for genes. And that's a little freer for mutation because it doesn't have an effect on the organism. So we can look at all these things to um, find out, at, you know, approximately how many million years ago they have branched. Using the molecular clock, we've actually studied, we use this for viruses as well, and we looked at HIV. And when you look at HIV, we can, you know, go back and say that it is estimated that it entered the human, excuse me, the human population in the 60s. Um, and the origin of the virus actually dates back in the 30s. So we can look at that. So it is, it is really kind of interesting, this tool. Um, there are two main, uh, two main schools of systematics. Um, cladistics and phonetics. Cladistics uses uh, homologous structures to organize life, and we have what's called a cladogram. So a cladogram, when you read this, so like everything on this, so everything here, all the way through here, has jaws. This is a hagfish. They are jawless fish. And then lungs. So of course, you know, fish have gills. And then up here we have salamanders don't have claws. Okay. So everything here, go here, have claws. And then we can keep going further um, where we break off into fur and mammary glands, which make up mammals. Okay. So this is again looking at homologous structures. We also have what's called Occam's razor. I love this, this particular um, I don't know what we would call it, but uh principle that the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. And we have this term called parsimony and we like things to be parsimonious. So for example, we have hummingbirds and we notice there are hummingbirds with blue feathers and red feathers. Now there are three species of hummingbirds. And so we're saying, okay, we have two of the three species have red feathers. So we could say that they branched off in independently both had mutations that made red feathers okay so we're basically saying the mutation happened twice or we could say that that mutation happened before the um they branched away from the blue ones and again so you only have that mutation happening once that is the most likely um, way this happened, okay, or what we would call more parsimonious. So looking at the difference between phonetic and traditional, okay, um, we have, I'm going to do a side-by-side -side here with phonetics and cladistics. So again, I remember one is looking at more molecular information. One is looking for actual, you know, the phenotype, the characteristics we see. And it kind of makes a little sense. Like if you were phonetic, you would say, yeah, a lizard and a crocodile, they have more similar traits than a bird. But when we look at evolutionary relationships, crocodiles and birds are related to dinosaurs they have more in common than lizards and so we put the crocodiles with the birds so again we have two ways of classifying two different systems of classifying we have to come to an agreement and you know with the technology of, you know with molecular biology and looking at dna and and stuff like that um there's it's a little harder to argue Okay, so in the past, before we had this technology, yeah, there was a big debate on which one was right. But with technology, we've kind of come a long way. So again, phonetics use anatomical data to construct phylogenetic trees. Like I said, there's a lot of debate, um, which is being cl clarified every year with new and new information. And so here is, again, the traditional versus the cladistics. And we can see where we had our early reptiles. And this is traditional. And then we have our mammals. Remember I talked about how class mammalia, reptilia, and birds. That's class A's. Okay. Birds would be like our dinosaurs. Okay. Versus now our cladistics are saying here, look at, look at here. They put they put the crocodiles, turtles, and snakes together. Here they're putting the birds 
and the crocodiles together and calling it class um, archaeosaurs, archaeosaurs, which makes sense because they're related to dinosaurs. All right. So again, the different way of organizing. And then we have that junk drawer. This is what we're doing now with that junk drawer. It's kind of crazy to think what we're doing. We're unpacking that junk drawer and thinking, okay, there's a different way we could classify life. Let's try this way. And so we have, these are called clades. And so we have these different clades that we look at and we've unpacked everything. So like almost all, oh, geez, I'm writing on the wrong thing. <laughs> all, many of these we're all in Protisa. And then we can see we've got our plantes in here. Here's fungi, animalia. So, and this is showing those evolutionary relationships. It's kind of cool. Okay. All right. So that's kind of classifying in a nutshell. And and the important thing is I'm not going to ask you like which one's um phonetics or cladistics or, you know, I just want you to know that there's different ways of classifying life. We're still working on it. Um, there's a lot of debate and with, like I said, with the, um, new ability to look at DNA and proteins, we're clarifying a lot of things up. Right. So I hope that's helpful for you. Um, we are now going to move forward into, um, a little more into human evolution. All right. So I will see you in the next presentation. Um, I will let me stop this, stop share. Um, if you have any questions, as always, give me a shout out and I will see you in the next presentation, 6B.